It's a race against time and tide in the wilds of Costa Rica. The Quest team's desperate mission to save endangered jungle cats. The unique islands of Galapagos. A colony of fur seals is threatened by a volcano's fury. And giant tortoises are in need of a matchmaker. <laughs> the team embarks on a flight for survival. Research vessel Quest and its team of adventurers and researchers is off the coast of Costa Rica in Central America. Captain John Fitzpatrick takes a call from the mainland. This is John on the bridge. It's an unusual invitation. The Quest is to become a troop carrier for rare jungle cats. Sabina Weber and Ziggy Wiesel are biologists from Germany. They came to Costa Rica seven years ago to study cats in the wild. But almost immediately, they were forced to build a refuge for wild animals being kept illegally in Costa Rican towns. Today, a dream fulfilled, courtesy of a European benefactor. Sabina and Ziggy are moving the cats to a new and luxurious home. We had to decide to find another place. So we got an offer from a person from Denmark who was willing to finance a completely new cat station. When this person came into our life and said, I'm going to build you up a brand new cat station, we were really, really happy. A dream not quite fulfilled. Not yet. Sabina and Ziggy need help. The quest help for a tough yet delicate task to move 25 animals from Dominica Lito on Costa Rica's west coast to the new field station 250 miles to the north at Nicoya Peninsula. Welcome to the quest. Travel by land isn't an option. Costa Rica's byways are rough and the cats are fragile. The trauma could kill them. So we've got to get some cats on the boat. We're going to have to put them on the top deck. This deck down here gets completely awash when we're steaming along. So we've got a cargo net and we'll put two or four cages in at a time, or we can lift them singly, whatever you feels better. John is the Quest's new captain, a veteran of strange waters and stranger situations, but he's never tackled a mission quite like this. The hangar there, you can put some of them in there. We're thinking of putting a big tarpaulin over the top to give the cats shelter from both the rain and the sun. So how many animals are you going to have, how many cages? We will probably have around 25 boxes. So if um, you're all happy with this area, um, you feel it'll be OK? No, it looks perfect. OK. Well, maybe, uh, Tolva, you could go ashore and have a look at the cages, um, just get a bit of the logistics of how we're going to get them on board, uh, just make sure that we're not missing anything there. I would love to come and see the cats. You're welcome to see them. Torva Peterson is the Quest underwater camera specialist, right, but this is a very different challenge. The beach closest to the field station is also near a tiny fishing village. The jungle cats will be ferried to the quest in small boats, an operation for which local equipment and local knowledge of tide and current will be crucial. The station is home to ocelots, margays, and a few jagarundi, some of the world's most endangered species. These cats are in crisis because the tropical forests of Central and South America are diminishing rapidly. Poaching, too, takes a terrible toll. Their pelts are prized, and laws against hunting are difficult to enforce. Keeping these jungle cats as house pets is also illegal. Costa Rican authorities confiscate captured animals and usually
usually, they're brought here. How long have you been caring for Tafa? For almost six years. You think she like me? Yeah, I think she will like you. She prefers men, but she's nice with everybody. Oh. <laughs> she's a rough tongue. Oh. If you like to, you can sit down there. Maybe she jumps on your lap. Hi, Tafa. And she's an ocelot? She's an ocelot in full grown. She's full grown, but she's very small for an ocelot because she got a bad nutrition oh. when she was a baby and she... <laughs> Tafa, wow, that tongue! Just watch out with your hair that she doesn't grab your hair. Ay, ay, ay! How come the tongue is so rough? They, they clean themselves very well and they take off the hair and they also use it to oh. take off the meat from the bones, from their prey. Is she getting very fighty here? Oh, look at her! Yeah. <laughs> I think you have something smelly on your legs, maybe cream. Yes, yeah, sunscreen. Some yeah, sunscreen. and that's why she rubs. So how did Tafa come here? She used to live in a hotel in Ciudad Quesada in Costa Rica. Yeah. And they were treating her nice, I think, because she's not afraid of people. But everybody was carrying her around, so she got imprinted on people. That's why she's tame like she is. Sabine, what do Captured you mean? cubs younger than eight weeks are denied any wild education from their mothers. And if raised by humans, cubs consider themselves human. I think it's actually impossible to rehabilitate imprinted animals. But we can use her for environmental education, especially with children here in this yes. area, and it's yes. very nice. They can see an ocelot close, they can even touch her. Sabina and Ziggy's goal is to release as many cats as possible back into the wild. But that will take planning, training, money, and most of all, time. For now, the best they can do is hold the line and keep safe their ever-increasing family of confiscated cats. The new field station is secure and well-equipped, ideal for beginning the long, complex task of preparing animals for the jungle. Ideal, maybe, but moving is often tinged with sadness. Our living the old place is kind of hard because it was my home for almost four years now and we have a lot of friends there, but on the other side the project has to go on. And this new place is much better, we have much better facilities, beautiful cages, and for the cats it will be extremely nice. Oh, Sabina, your favorites? Yeah, these are Jaguarun, these are Jaguarun, a black one. Even if you get them small, they turn out to be very wild, wilder than the Margis ever get, and have a nice spirit. And I see a big smile on your face now, why is that? This is because he just showed it again, that he's a wild cat. Because when you have a tame cat, it comes to the fence when I bring a person like you. And he stays away and he really tries to avoid people. And he even does this in the cage, so I think if we release him, he will just run away and he doesn't want to see people again. <laughs> Sabine, this is not what I think it is, is it? It is. It is the unpleasant part. When you work with carnivores, you have to realize that you have to feed meat because they're strictly meat eaters. And to give them a really nice food is to provide whole animals, which means whole rabbits, whole guinea pigs, quails, pigeons, chicken. Because this is another aspect of the project that we want to rehabilitate our cats. So they have to learn how to survive in the wild. We have to know if they are capable to kill animals and to eat them. And they have to be trained to do this really perfect. So we need live food. The transport boxes are specially designed and baited for quick results. Timing is crucial here because animals kept in boxes for too long can become traumatized. Some of the cats are tame and can be handled, but most are too dangerous to touch or even approach. Such an animal is the delightful Mrs. Ling. She's ignoring the bait and is highly aggressive. Given half a chance, she'll attack. Finally, Mrs. Ling enters her box, and at the risk of a serious mauling, Ziggy sneaks in. All 
All 25 jungle cats are secure and ready to travel, but not until late afternoon. The operation is way behind schedule. Time is the enemy and the task enormous. They have to get the snarling cargo to the beach, to the boats, and finally to the quest, which has to be underway before dark. The entire village of Dominicalito is turned out for the show. For the children, this could be a last chance to see such biological treasures. The children are very excited. The news spreads and all these people are around, and for them it's, it's something different. Most of them, unfortunately, can't see these cats anymore in the forest. The tide is high, but so is the swell. Fishermen are recruited to ferry the cats, but the tricky surf limits each boatload to two or three boxes. On the quest, everyone is pressed into action. All hands are needed to meet this deadline. Suddenly, what everyone fears, a boat close to capsizing. The cats are drenched and one is in danger of drowning. For a terrible moment, panic. Well, I was a little bit scared about it because I thought it, the, the water would actually come into the boat and flood the cages but we made it. Although soaked, the cats are okay, but they can't take much more. Incredibly, it just gets worse. Enter the local police investigating reports of a supposed cat smuggling operation. Ziggy has permits, but the paperwork's aboard the quest. Sorting it all out eats valuable time. Well, they have to check uh, whether we have the permit to transport the animals. Also, oh, they are or, worried that we're going to take the cats in and yes, leave for, the country. For, in, for instance. Ah, oh, okay. And it makes sense. Yes. So, you would have a lot of trouble then. Finally, the police are satisfied, and it's back to work. The cats are hurried into their shipboard shelter for what hopefully will be an uneventful journey. When we first heard about the cat transfer, we all imagined that we'd be carrying animals about the size of lions. Imagining one of those big cats loose on the deck of the boat had all the crew anticipating a major catastrophe. On seeing the size of the cats, however, we were all very relieved. Quest is underway. It's a 12-hour steam to the cat's new home. Sabina stays up all night in case the animals become distressed or need food or water. Ty, the little margay, is very nervous and gets some special attention. As morning breaks, the quest arrives at Nicoya. The bay is sheltered, the water calm. Landing the cats is relatively easy. state-of-the-art. The cages are 50 feet long, 25 feet high, and wide. Cat runs allow the animals ease of movement from pen to pen.
despite all they've endured over the last 30 hours, the cats are in good health. They'll take a few days to adjust to their new home and work out how to use all that extra space. For staff, there are comfortable cabins overlooking the river. Can you still post your animals? Huh? Yeah, you can almost see them there over there. The new complex has a laboratory, food preparation areas, and veterinary facilities. How long do you think it will take Scooter to feel at home in his new home? Well, obviously he feels quite at home already and I'm surprised, but lots of the cats just sitting in their boxes now it will take a couple of days. And Scooter, what do you think about your new home? Huh? He looks very comfortable, actually. Oh, he is. But of course it's easier with animals which are tame because you can calm them down as a person. The wild ones yeah. you just have to leave alone. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. When the cats are settled, Ziggy and Sabina will observe them closely, then select suitable candidates for the wild. Eventually, some will be taken to remote forest areas, fitted with radio collars, and released. For 12 months, Ziggy will track their progress. We do hope that with the help of this cat station, we can actually do the real work, what we were planning to do in the beginning, the first few years. And keeping the cats in a good condition is just one part but the release work of the cats, the observations we're doing with the cats, that's the second part. The future for me will be hopefully that I can work more as a biologist again, because in the old place I ended up being the, the girl for everything. I had to organize things and there was no time to do real good work to bring out the animals. And now we can prepare the animals very good because I can just direct people doing the work and then Ziggy can go on and can release them. Mission accomplished. For Tova, it's back to the quest for some well-earned sleep. Before leaving the wilds of Costa Rica, the team has a final task. The quest journeys to Golfo Dulce, a deep gulf along the southern coast. The waters here are pristine, or are they? Pesticides like DDT are restricted, but it's feared they're still being used in the plantations lining the gulf. Marine biologist Priscilla Cubera from the National University of Costa Rica is studying the resident population of bottlenose dolphins. They live along the coastline, feeding at the river mouths, where runoff from the plantations meets the sea. For me, Golfo Dulce is uh, the most um, special place in Costa Rica, because um, there are two species of dolphins living in here, and that's very weird to find, really. It's very important also for people I usually am very concerned about people and the environment interacting. Many people depend on the gold and its resources. Priscilla needs dolphin tissue to test for toxins. She's called on the quest and on expedition leader, Andrew White. Hi. Hi. Hello. So what's the plan going to be, Priscilla? I know here in Costa Rica they're interested in um, making Golfo Dulce a protected area because it isn't now. So they need information to support um, that idea, you know, so uh, this will help a lot, I think. So the next step, I guess, where we can help you is to get a dolphin. Yes, yeah. to get a dolphin. Now, Working with the team is Dr. Paul Forrestal, a professor of marine biology from Long Island University. To obtain tissue samples quickly and with a minimum of pain, Paul has a special crossbow. It penetrates just below the skin um, into the blubber and then bounces back off again. In a 
addition to the samples of dolphin fat, the Quest can help Priscilla by recording the behavior of individuals. It's a job for the poll camera of team member Jonathan Summerhays. Dolphins are staying with the boats. Paul's ready to test his marksmanship. Okay, folks. Um, I just sterilized this tip and put antibiotic on it. If we get, if we get uh, tissue inside it, we have to be really careful not to contaminate it, so we don't want to touch it at all. The dart has to strike at just the right angle. The dolphins may feel a quick sting, but nothing more. Yeah, I can see it right here, Andrew. When testing for toxins, a fat sample is essential. No, nothing. Okay, let's hope we've got a nice sample here. Okay, Paul, we got one! Good one! Working with Priscilla are veterinarians Maria and Victor. They'll prepare and store the samples and have the results from the Costa Rican capital San Jose in just a few days. Sadly, Priscilla's suspicions have proved correct. The tissue sample contained derivatives of DDT. With this new hard evidence, however, it will be easier for authorities to strike at the problem. New laws may be needed, or better policing of existing laws. The future of the local bottlenose population depends on decisive action, as does the future of the people who make a living from these waters. I mean, in terms of having the chance to work with you on this, for me, this is kind of uh, the ultimate science situation where it isn't just coming out and collecting data, but we're thinking in terms of how the impact of our work influences the animals, and we're thinking in terms of how the, our findings are going to influence human use of this area. This is important because cetaceans in general are in the highest point of the food chain, and if they have something that will mean that other species below in the food chain are affected as well. So uh, this will give us reasons to say that this place, Golfo Dulce, needs to be protected. The quest leaves Costa Rica. Its destination, the Galapagos Islands off Ecuador in South America. A pod of playful dolphins has decided to play escort. of helicopter pilot James Daly spot movement ahead. Hey, John, we got a few whales out here, mate, on the, sort of about the east, southeast of us here. Peter, Peter, this is John on the bridge. Uh, we've got a couple of whales off to the port side out here. We want to get the naiad ready. Uh, if you could please prepare it to go in the water. Everyone is in motion. Opportunities to film whales are rare. It's a good test of how quickly the crew can mobilize. And they're directly ahead of you. Uh, if you can hear me, they're about uh, 300 meters ahead of you, directly ahead of you. There they come. See some over there. They've chanced upon a pod of short fin pilot whales, and with them, a large sperm whale. Dive 
dive master Lynn Nicoletti is ever eager for a new encounter. Hit the water now, go! I've never actually swam with short fin pilot whales before. It's phenomenal, just the noises that they were making and the fact that there were so many of them wasn't just one whale. And then to have one come right up next to me and really check me out it was fantastic. The team is able to get so close because the whales are resting. Soon they'll stir, moving with the equatorial currents to new feeding grounds. Three of them just came straight for us until they pointed, and I dived down and it came straight past me. And Lynn was heading up like to the other whales, right? And I turned around and the whale was just coming straight next to Lynn and point, and she's like, wow! Crossing the equator, the so-called line, is a profound seafaring event. It demands sacred rituals. Thank you for coming across the equator. We're now officially in the southern hemisphere. Who's got the ancient gourd? Ancient gourd? Andrew is King Neptune. He and willing helpers must test the worthiness of the crew. All those who have dared to come here today do so at their peril to cross the line. All those who don't have their certificate, step forward. You must skull the magic potion. Skull the potion. First timers, or polywogs, are initiated into the most royal and sacred order of the deep. Heads are shaved, then a dunking in a slimy, stinking concoction. Are you ready, Torva? Yep. Okay. Tradition reserves the harshest treatment for the leader. After their adventures in Costa Rica, this is a welcome, much needed release. Quest enters the waters of the unique Galapagos Archipelago. The Galapagos National Park has asked the Quest to help with a census of the fur seal population and to airlift giant tortoises for a breeding program. Geologically, the Galapagos Islands are young. They are huge volcanoes which rose from the seafloor in a cascade of momentous eruptions just five million years ago. At first, the islands were barren, but eventually life found a way. They were colonized by birds and marine mammals, by plants whose seeds were carried on the wind or deposited in bird droppings. And incredibly, by land animals whose only means of getting here was to survive somehow on driftwood, an almost inconceivable journey from the coast of South America, 650 miles away. The species of the Galapagos have a special place in the history of science. In 1835, a young naturalist, Charles Darwin, came here to study. What he saw began a train of thought which culminated a quarter of a century later in a revolutionary theory, the theory of natural selection. Many Galapagos plants and animals are found nowhere else. Darwin realized that in isolation, they had evolved here, adapting to their volcanic environment over many generations. One such species is the Galapagos fur seal, which thrives in these tropical waters because of a phenomenon called upwelling, the rise of cold, nutrient-rich water from the great depths which surround the islands. 
The fur seal's coat was much prized by man. During the 1800s, they were killed in the tens of thousands, hunted almost to extinction. The population remains fragile, and in 1995, it was put under a new stress by the lava flows of a volcanic eruption on the island of Fernandina. In this area as well, there are, uh, um, there are opportunities. There are... Godfrey Merlin is a marine biologist who has spent 25 years working with the Charles Darwin Research Station in Galapagos. There's a sheer cliff right uh, to the north of the, the Fur Seal colony, um, and um, this whole western coast is uh, pretty rugged. Godfrey wants to take a census of fur seals at Fernandina's Cape Hammond. He hasn't been here since the 1998 El Nino season, and he's worried about the colony's progress. The area is rugged and very difficult to access, but the census has made a mission possible by the Quest helicopter. It was a very spectacular event. Uh, you can see the lava, black lava flow uh, coming down from the summit of the volcano, and um, most of it went into the sea to the north, the uh, molten rock, but there was a, quite a strong flow which came down directly towards Cape Hammond, and the water temperature was certainly boiling right on the shoreline, and uh, a number of animals uh, suffered from the consequences of the molten lava entering the sea. We just realized how tenuous life really is in the Galapagos because I'd imagine one big volcanic eruption, it could all be gone tomorrow. Absolutely. We really don't have a good enough understanding of the way fur seals live uh, in order to protect them. We've got a bunch of pups in the pool here. There are no adults there at all. So we can try and uh, just count them. So how important is the census? I mean, what's its purpose? Uh, the main purpose is to provide baseline data uh, for how the population does under, under certain conditions, um, with more monitoring of the ocean, uh, measurements of uh, temperature, uh, fish abundance. It's very important to understand how animals like the fur seals are reacting to the environment and to changes in the environment if we wish to um, uh, preserve their, their populations. So these guys are getting their muscles tuned up to head out over there into the uh, deep ocean. This lava-enclosed pool protects the colony from predators such as sharks and killer whales. It's a circus of seals, and Andrew is in on the act. Having the opportunity to play with young animals of any species is always fun, but seals are especially fun because they're so playful. The unique part about Fernandina is we've got this swimming pool environment which has been created by the, the lava flows, and getting in amongst them, you know, they're biting and nipping at each other and swimming around, they're just a delight to film. is really important to me because I see all around the world a, a severe deterioration in, in marine environments and in Galapagos we not only have um, a, an area full of um, animals which are unique to the world but we also have an area which has still got all its major components. We still have an ecosystem which is functioning in a way in which it has developed over, over hundreds of thousands of years. Godfrey is ecstatic at the results of his census. Cape Hammond Colony is growing. The population has now exceeded the strength it showed before the volcanic eruption. Two hundred years ago, hundreds of thousands of giant tortoises roamed the volcanic slopes of Galapagos. Then came man. Tortoises were taken alive aboard whaling ships to feed the crews. 
Later colonists hunted them for meat and oil. Three of the 14 tortoise subspecies are extinct. 90% of the pre-human population has been wiped out. Today, the survivors number fewer than 15,000. The quest has an urgent mission, to airlift these gentle giants from remote areas on the island of Isabella to the breeding station on Via Mio, on Isabella's southern coast. 15 tortoises are needed from the rarest, most threatened subspecies. Tom Fritz is a research biologist who has been working with the Charles Darwin Foundation. He's been involved with the tortoise breeding station since it opened in 1989. I started out studying giant tortoises from a point of view of asking the question of, of were the individual populations distinguishable on the basis of their shell shape? Much the same question that the governor of Galapagos posed to Charles Darwin when he first visited here. But as I studied them, I realized that those differences in shell shape and color coincided with differences in ecology and the evolutionary history of the tortoises. So I became more and more involved in the conservation and management of tortoises, realizing what fascinating and wonderful creatures they were. Captive breeding is the best way to boost tortoise numbers, because here the young are safe from predators. Over 15 years, Nearly 2,000 captive-bred tortoises have been released to the wild. Animals introduced by settlers contributed to the tortoise's demise and plague them still. Pigs have a taste for tortoise eggs, dogs, cats, and rats kill the young, and goats compete for food. Attempts to control their numbers have met with limited success. We've got all these pens here, and these are quite small. What are these ones? These individuals are only two months in, in age. Oh, they're tiny. You can see they are an exact replicate of, of the tortoises that we were looking at as adults. <laughs> and this is what they started out as. The eggs uh, from all of the species are about this size and uh, uh, relatively hard-shelled uh, and take about 90 to uh, 150 days to hatch. How many would be in a, is it a clutch of eggs that they lay? Uh, some of our, our tortoises here from Isabella lay about uh, 20 eggs in a clutch and may lay uh, two to three clutches a year. So what's the ultimate aim here? How many tortoises a year would be bred from this facility and reintroduced into the wild? Under ideal conditions, we would produce several hundred individuals every year and, and put them back into to the most critically reduced populations. Andrew and James are ready for some heavy lifting, tortoise lifting, but they need a guide. Carl Campbell from the Galapagos National Park has trekked this rough terrain and knows the area well. Uh, this sort of terrain, well, you try and avoid it whenever you can, but uh, quite often you've just got to go through it. Breeding station field hand Pablo has been in the Sierra Negra region for weeks. His tasks, to find suitable tortoises from the most threatened subspecies and to cut a landing patch for the helicopter. Pablo has no radio. It's up to Andrew and James to find him. Yeah, guys have actually gone in there. They've been in there for around six days. Um, some of them have been in there for 10 days. Um, locating tortoises and uh, clearing these sites so that the chopper can land and then we can uh, actually do these pickups. James spots Pablo beside a clearing. How many do you have here, Pablo? Oh, two big females. I think we can get both of these in the net. I mean, they don't seem to be that heavy. Until today, the only way to bring tortoises from the wild was by hand, carrying them in makeshift slings for many miles and usually over crippling terrain. It's tough, so tough that just 15 tortoises have made the journey in the last decade. I mean, you really got to admire those sailors. These things would be damn heavy to bring down off the top of an island. Yeah, definitely, although this is relatively a small one compared to what they'd be doing. 
put them side by side. Yep. Now be okay, right. you think? You can stand here, Pablo, like that. Right. You get one of you just to hold the net so they don't escape. James is an experienced sling loader, but he's never carried live cargo. He needs to be gentle. Okay, James, take up the slack. Yeah, not a problem. There was a bit of trepidation when James first took off with the tortoises because we really didn't know how they'd handle the flying. But it was really quite funny actually because as soon as they lifted off, their arms came out, their legs went out, their heads stuck out, and it was as if they were really enjoying the experience of uh, seeing the landscape from a different perspective. When backs are turned, one of the tortoises makes a run for it, but the great escape doesn't last long. These tortoises are magnificent creatures, and to, to be involved with uh, in contributing in any way to the ultimate survival and, and, and expansion of these tortoises for the enjoyment of future generations is real uh, pleasure and honor. It's exciting. This tortoise would be about five years old and uh, he's just about to that point where he's ready to be released into the wild. He's now uh, essentially immune to attacks by cats and, and rats and other, other dangers of, of nature. The second part of the team's mission is to release healthy, captive-bred juveniles in regions where the population is depleted. Emotionally, youngsters are fragile. There's a risk flying will traumatize them. Tom and Andrew decide on a trial run with a lap tortoise. There's no sign of stress. It's safe to proceed. Tom and his crew select the tortoises to be released. This is a rare opportunity for Tom, free access to a helicopter. He makes full use of it. By raising tortoises here under ideal conditions in captivity, we can ensure that they are in good health when we return them to the field. Of the tortoises that we return to the wild at the age of four or five, we have uh, survival rates of in excess of 75%. It was a real uh, exciting to see the tortoises airlifted with the helicopter and and certainly James's experience in you know, manipulating uh, the slings with very gentle hand on the uh, rudder of the ship was a good job done. These tortoises are around six years of age, have no natural predators, and should do well in the wild. Each has a number painted on the shell and an electromagnetic bead implanted in the skin, which allows Tom to track them. We do monitor the tortoises that we release in the wild, and we find that they basically do stay in the general area where they're released, and oftentimes for periods of 10 or 15 years. Pablo has found two mature tortoises in a remote part of the island, 
It's a tremendous find. They are male and female and belong to one of the most depleted subspecies. He's tethered them to a tree and given directions to James. Ooh, how heavy is he going to be? Bloody heavy. Uh, might need three of us to lift him, I think. I guess this is what the sailors used to do, tie him up on the ship and fresh meat for about a year. One, two, three. <coughs> These beasts can weigh as much as 600 pounds and often live to be over 100 years old. You OK? Lift him. Keep going a little more. I was really surprised with the tortoises how big they were. I mean, you see them in pictures and you, you see them in film, but it's not until you get on the corner of one and try and lift it up to put it in that cargo net that you realise how large and ancient a creature they really are. Okay. Yep. okay. Oh. People in the breeding station over the last 10 years have had to slug it out on the hot lava flows carrying the tortoises back by hand. So for us, the opportunity to in one day bring back more tortoises than they had got in the last 10 years really made us feel a great sense of achievement that we've had hands-on involvement in this conservation program. Pretty happy with the ones we got? Oh, they're great. And these are all mature females and males, and, and uh, we're in good shape. They'll be a good contribution to the program. Several of these populations were in, on the verge of extinction at the time when the, the conservation programs were developed, and we are making progress in, in offsetting that. In some cases, even if we haven't been able to solve the threats, we have bought ourselves a hundred years to work on them in the future. This old fella is just too heavy. All they can do is point him in the right direction to make his own way to his new home. It's time for the quest to leave the amazing islands of Galapagos. The team has shared in a treasure of wildlife, both here and in Costa Rica. When we got the offer from the Quest to transport the cats, we were very happy about that. She is so beautiful. I never thought I was going to hold a cat like her in my arms. Oh my goodness me. It worked out perfect and it helped us a lot. And the animals came into the new place less stressed than if we had transported them with a the truck. I arrived originally on a sailing vessel and we acted as a volunteer at the research station from where it developed, but um, a place like this is the reason I stay. The opportunity to work with the Quest team has been a great advantage to getting these critically needed tortoises into the breeding center. Well, it's Tomorrow, new horizons, new waters, and new adventures of the quest. <laughs>